for the benefit of those of us who maybe have not been with this ministry for too long, maybe you've just been with us, maybe in the very reason, from the very recent uh, while, maybe for your benefit, because I'm sure this is information that those of us who have been members of SITAM, I think are aware of. Allow me just to maybe just set the record straight on one or two things. First of all, Crisis Yansa Ministries is supported. Everything that we do, church planting, the ministries that we run, all the um, human resource that we need, of course, to run this ministry, the salaries and everything. Actually, everything is run through the generous and consistent and faithful giving of members of this ministry through your offerings, through your tithes. And I must commend here in Sitem Woodley, I think you have demonstrated yourselves as a church that truly loves to give. This is a very generous congregation. And all across Sitem, of course, we have members who are very faithful and faithfully give. But I want to just uh, mention that it is important for you to know, due to some reports, especially this past week on social media, it is important for you to know and remember that the pastors, all the pastors uh, who, of course, are in our ministries, those here in Sitem Woodley and any one of our Sitem assemblies, we do not handle tithes and offerings. Are you with me? When Sunday comes and you give, we have men and women, volunteers, called ushers, who normally collect all these monies and they go and uh, tabulate everything, count everything, and ensure that that money is delivered to the bank. So we do not enrich ourselves as pastors through your giving. All the pastors in Sitam, actually all the staff who are in Sitam, all of us are on a monthly salary. All right? So we do not handle any of your, of your finances. So please be aware of that because there are some, maybe out of their own malicious reasons, who sometimes will want to portray as if... Uh, um, you know, pastors in Sitam are enriching themselves through the giving of God's people. That is not true. And I think you know that. By the way, do you know that all our books are audited every year? And you have, you know, during the times when we have uh, the annual general meeting for you to come and scrutinize our books and everything is handled professionally. We have a whole finance department that takes care and uh, manages and administrates all the finances. We have a uh, deacon board in place and we have various personnel who are given that responsibility. So please just maybe for your own good and for just maybe for your own information so that when you are confronted with some of these things, you can confidently say that I know my church, Crisis Answer Ministries, yes, we do know that there are other ministries and other churches, which usually is a one-man show, where the man of God handles everything himself, but not here in Sitam. We have structures and uh, we have processes that are in place, all right? So please do not be deceived. Do not be taken in by some of these waves sometimes, especially as they seek to discredit the body of Christ. Please understand that those are sometimes the tactics of the enemy, so that the church can actually lose its credibility. But we know that God still has a remnant. Oh, I wish I had some witnesses in the house of the Lord. God still has a remnant. And can I just advise us? I mean, how many of you here, you love the Lord? Let me see, you love the Lord. How many of you, you love your church? You love your church. This is, that's why you came, isn't it? Please, do not engage in that negative talk and, or forwarding uh, those text messages that sometimes you receive. You know, oh, this is not what they are doing in our church. That is not clever. I, I have never met, I am yet to meet somebody who uh, goes and starts gossiping about their own family. You know, no, even if your father used to be a drunkard. Did you used to go to the whole village and tell them how bad your father was? You don't do that, isn't it? You protect that which is your own and that which you believe in. All right? So please, let's, uh, let's just exercise that. And uh, I know God will continue blessing this ministry in Jesus' name. Now, I just want to pick up very quickly from where we left last week. We were talking about the four lepers in the book of um, First Kings, was it? Just get that very quickly for us. We just want to pick up from there as we move along. In this missions month, I want to appreciate 
all those who have really, really plugged in in this month of missions and outreach. Yesterday we had a full day of activity. Uh, a good number of us were out at uh, Dagoreti with a medical camp. Pastor Dongo has already alluded to that. Uh, 445 people were treated yesterday. We had a lot of medics and a lot of medication and these people were treated and uh, out of that, of course, they were also ministered to, sharing the word of the, you know, the gospel with them and the 87 of them gave their lives to the Lord. I'm also informed that we had uh, men and women also out in a children's home yesterday and, and, and a good number of us were also out in a old people's home. And I want to just appreciate all of you who have really, really plugged in uh, during this month of uh, missions and outreach. Let's keep the fire burning. In tell your neighbor, keep the fire burning. Okay, if that one doesn't have any fire, turn to the other one and tell them, please, keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. The fire of the gospel. Let's just keep it burning in Jesus' name. Amen? Um, and um, uh, an announcement has already been given to us about uh, our Kibira here. And uh, just to invite us to participate. I want to just make this special appeal. We're only making this appeal to us today, just for us today. Uh, especially as, uh, as part of our outreach this month, and uh, as part of also our, our, our corporate social responsibility and responding to current need. You do know what is going on just across here in Kibera. And many people have lost their homes. Uh, many people, of course, even the church buildings and uh, about eight pastors came to us not so long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, and actually really, really do, did appeal to us uh, for help if there's anything we can do to help them. And uh, I want to appeal to us Probably, maybe as an individual, you may feel led as a family that, hey, I want to do something. I want to plug in. Uh, you can be able, please come and see. You can see me. You can see Pastor Grace or you can see Pastor George Mauricio uh, because we're the ones who have been dealing with those pastors directly. Or maybe as a, your corporate board, maybe you, you come from an organization, uh, maybe a business or whatever, and part of your social responsibility or corporate social responsibility, you feel like you would like to do something. Nothing is too small. Now, those churches have, have had to hire tents every Sunday and chairs and what have you, and it's really difficult for them. And we felt that if we can at least be able to alleviate some of that suffering, maybe give them chairs if we can or some tents. And then for some of the people who have lost homes, uh, you know, if you have clothes and, of course, clothes that can still be used for children and maybe things like mattresses and blankets and those kind of things, I think before the end of this month, we can be able to reach out to that community and just be a blessing to them because that's what Christianity is all about. All right? So we are not going to make this announcement again just for, the, for today. So if you would like to plug in, and I know many of you would like to plug in either uh, corporately, I mean as, a, as your corporation, or individually, please come and see us. But let's do something. In fact, that's what I want to speak to us about this afternoon uh, in the remaining parts of this service. And my sermon is entitled, The Power of Love. The power of love, because you cannot be able to reach out to people unless you have the love of God in your heart and unless you truly love people. And we want to just be able to look at that now. Just taking you back very quickly, First uh, Kings chapter 7, last Sunday, uh, we looked at this story of the four lepers. You remember in chapter 6 and chapter 7, and these lepers who got together, um, and you remember the story, I may not be able to go back to the full story, but you remember the story that these four lepers came together, they realized that they were in a predicament, the whole city was under siege, the city of Samaria was under siege, but these four gentlemen realized that they also were in serious need because they were leprous, they had leprosy, which means they had been isolated from the community, uh, and they were hungry, there was no more food available. And they decided and chose among themselves to do something. And out of their conf conferencing together and out of that desperate situation, there was a glimmer of hope. You remember that last Sunday? I'm going to talk to me, congregation. All right? You remember? There was a small glimmer of hope. And the only hope they had lay in the enemy's camp. You remember that? Where they came from, it was hopeless. I mean, they couldn't go back. I mean, after all, they were already isolated because they were leprous. But again, even if they were to go back there, there was no food. But there was one little glimmer of hope. And they said, let's go to the enemy. There's food in the enemy's camp. It is the enemy, but there's, at least there's food there. And they chose and decided, let's go there. If we die, we die. In fact, they said, if we, they kill us, we do what? We will die. 
So, but then they chose to then say, let's act, you know, let's, let's, this was an act of faith for them. And out of hope, they acted by faith. Notice that. Out of hope, they acted by faith. Out of hope, they did what? Acted by faith. And because of that act of faith, God honored that act of faith. With every step that they took towards the enemy's camp, what they did not know is that God would use every step and magnify every step such that the enemy began hearing the sound of chariots approaching, the sound of horses approaching, and the enemy decided to take off. By the time these four lepers got to the enemy's camp, there was nobody there. And suddenly they were confronted with all this food and with all this silver and gold, and they began to eat. But as they did that, and of course they began to hide some of the silver and gold, uh, they, they, then they came back together again. Then they say to each other in verse 9, what we are doing is not right. You remember that? And the conference, they said, what we are doing is actually not right. This is a day of good news. And we are keeping it to ourselves. And we discovered last Sunday that when God has blessed you, because we are just but lepers, people. You remember that? That's what we are. We are lepers who have a full stomach. Lepers who have been blessed because remember we discovered that leprosy was, uh, was, gave us a very good and type of and picture in the scriptures of the effects and the devastation of sin because the wages of sin is death. And the, normally in the Bible, leprosy normally will be, will be used to typify and to signify sin. And we discover that we are but lepers who have been blessed. We have discovered there is somewhere there is food where we can be nourished. We have discovered there is a place where there is abundance, silver and gold. But we cannot keep it to ourselves. Like this four gentlemen, they decided we cannot keep it to themselves. Why? They said this is a day of... Now, you'll help me preach, people. All right? This is a day of... Good news, and they said we must do something about it now. Notice the Apostle Paul says this in First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. He says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of this is love. Notice, he said, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of this is what? Is love. In other words, for these four lepers, going back to that story, they had a little hope, they acted by faith, but there was one more component that was left, the component of love. Are you with me? Now, they could have chosen, by the way, remember, they have all this food, they had all the silver, the gold, the horses, everything was at their disposal. They could have said, listen, by the way, every man for himself and God for all of us. They could have said, listen, we have already been banished from the city. Those people have refused to help us. We have been isolated. I mean, what are the sort? They could have said that, isn't it? They could have said, it is none of our business. In fact, we are, we are, we are isolated anyway. They could have said, let the people because remember the city was under siege. They could have said, it is none of my business. I don't, have to, I don't have to worry about them. I mean, let them find help another way uh, for us. Let's just enjoy the abundance and the goodness of the Lord. But they said, it is not good. What we are doing is not because today is a day of good news. And they decided to act in love. Because now, what they did when they went back to the city to announce to the city that, listen, we went to the enemy's camp. We found the enemy had deserted the whole camp. There is food there. There is abundance. What were they doing? They were acting in love. Why? Because faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of this is what? Is love. In other words, for us, we came to Christ by faith. He has given us hope. He has provided for our needs. We have found a place where we can find, nour find nourishment. But our experience is not complete until we act in love. And how do we act in love? We must go and tell the world. We must go and tell our neighbors, listen, you don't have to starve. We have found a place where you can find something to eat. And that is why it is important for us. Yesterday as we went to Dagoretti and, you know, treating those, those people, people we didn't even know. We, we, were not, we did not go there and say only Christians. In fact, Pastor Dong was telling us that we even had Muslims coming in there. But as we were touching them physically... We were also sharing with them the love of Christ, isn't it? We're saying, did we have to go there? No. But we say we want to act in love. What we have discovered is too good for us to keep to ourselves. 
Are, are you with me? And that's why we're challenging you in this month. You cannot keep it to yourself. The world is starving. People are hungry. Let me tell you, do not let the affluence of this world and the monies and people looking good and dressing well, do not let that fool you. You can find people who are really dressed well, but yet they are still lost spiritually. They may look like they have big cars and living in big homes, but they are still miserable. Because until you find Christ, oh come on, can I pre help me preach this afternoon? Until you have found the Lord, it doesn't matter how much money you have. How many of you know that for sure? You can have all the money and all the affluence. Do you realize that people even in Hollywood are still committing suicide? Why? Is it because they don't have money? They have money, but they are still lost. They still need us to go out and tell them, listen, you don't have to do that. We have found a place where you can find, can find nourishment. We have found a savior who also loves you. Because as, until they found the Lord, they will always be lost. They are still lost. So these four lepers demonstrate to us love. Friends, there is power in love. Tell your neighbor there is power in love. There is power. Our gospel, the good news of the kingdom, is the news of love. Are you hearing what I'm saying? As somebody has said that if the church was a club, then it is the only club that exists for the benefit of non-members. We are here not just for ourselves, friends. We are here for the benefit of those who are yet to find themselves into this fold. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And we have to reach out to them. By the way, how many of you did my homework? Let me see. Last week I gave you homework. Nobody did my homework? Eh. The homework was very simple. To invite somebody to church. Anybody invited? Anybody? Let me see. Oh, ye faithful ones. May the Lord bless you. But you still have an opportunity. All right? It's not just about filling the pews. It's inviting somebody to church, telling them, listen, come and see and find and discover what I have found for myself. That Jesus is a savior. And Jesus is able to save you. We can still do it. I said we can still do it. Okay, please don't feel guilty. Relax. Don't, don't feel. You can look at me now. Just look at me. I know you didn't do it. I know you forgot. You know, the cares of this world overtook you. But just look at me. Don't worry. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Tell your neighbor you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Pastor forgives you. Amen. Amen. Now you relax. Now you're relaxed? Okay, let's go on. So the power of love. So these three remain faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of this is love. We, uh, now, the Apostle Paul talked about and he introduced to us a phrase that is powerful. He uses it actually twice. He calls it the labor of love. And we and I, you and I have an opportunity to engage in a labor of love. This is what he says in First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. He says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our, in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, or your labor of love, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Still capturing the three concepts, faith, hope, and then he calls it the labor of love. Then Hebrews chapter 6, again, he captures the same thing and says, God is not unjust, he will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each one of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that you, you, uh, what you hope for may be fully realized. Still talking about that God is not, he will not forget your work and the love that you have shown, your labor, he will not forget the labor of your love. In other words, friends, we have an opportunity to begin investing in eternity through our labor of love. Are you with me? Now, our love and this love, the power of love, is usually expressed in two areas in our lives. And I want to show you that and then we'll be done for the day. It is expressed. Remember we are talking about the power of love. It is usually and will find its way in our lives and in our hearts in two spheres and in two fronts. The first one is our love for God. 
my love for God. I know you came to church today because you, anybody who loves the Lord in this place, because we, that's why we worship him. That's why we praise him. But remember that that love for God is not just, it's not just expressed only by the fact that we came to church and call ourselves Christians. There are certain things, there are certain things that you'll find in a believer, somebody who truly a lover of God, you'll find these things in their lives. And I want to show them to us even as we move along. But uh, before we even look at them, and there are just a few of them, Second Timothy. Now, Paul writing to the young apostle Timothy, he tells him, mark this in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. How many of you believe you are, living, you are truly living in the last days? All right? We're truly living in the last days. He says there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Notice, not lovers of God. They will be lovers of themselves. It will be about me, myself, and I. Lovers of money. No wonder people are stealing in terms of billions in the times that we're living in. They will be boastful. They will be proud. Abusive. I mean, if there was a time you see people being abusive, it is now. Have you ever noticed how people are abusive, especially on social media? And now you're pretending like you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, people can be abusive on social media, man, and they can use all kinds of languages. But the funny thing is that usually that's an act of cowardice. Because the same people face to face, they will not tell you the same things they will tell you on social media. Because, you know, faith, uh, social media is faceless. Come and tell me what you said on social media. Most of them will not. But people have become very abusive, by the way. Disobedient to their parents. Young people, disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Oh, how easy it is for us to just be takers and takers and takers. But no, we are not grateful. We are not a grateful people. You see that all around us. Unholy, without love. He says people will be unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure than lovers of God. Having, and then he, notice how he concludes and says, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then he says, have nothing to do with such people. So it's easy for people then, you can actually find people who are very religious. All right? It's easy to be religious. However, it's a form of godliness but that denies the power. Because what is the power of the gospel? The power of the gospel is the love of God. Amen. Are you with me? So you find people, they can, but have you noticed that there are people who can do all these things? They can be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They, 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 they love pleasure more than they love God. And they, they're treacherous, they're slanderers. And yet they still come to church. Have you ever noticed that? Yes. Oh, come on, people. Because... You know, have you ever noticed that sometimes it's actually fashionable to say that you're a Christian? Oh, talk to me, people. It's very fashionable by the way to say, oh, even me, I'm a Christian. I belong to this church. I belong to that church. I belong to that other organization there. But it's people who sometimes have a form of godliness, but there is no power in that religion of theirs. So how is our love for God then expressed? Because then we have to separate that which is real, a real experience, and from that which is counterfeit. So the first thing is that if you have a love for God, a genuine love for your creator, for God, is that it will affect your priorities in life. Your priorities should reflect who you love. Can I repeat that? You're very quiet in here. I said your priorities should affect, or your, your love should affect your priorities. And your priorities will demonstrate who you love, where your heart is, I can tell you. In other words, it's your priorities in your money. That is why the Bible talk, uh, teaches and teaches us to be people who give our tithe. Bring your tithe into the storehouse. Why? Because God... Uh, 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 is trying to help us to learn to prioritize our lives. Have you ever noticed when you pay your tithe how it is easier to prioritize everything else? Have you ever noticed that by the way in your finances? Come on, talk to me somebody in this place. All right? It's usually much easier to prioritize even your finances after you have paid your tithe. When you have not, 
Your finances are all over the place. All right? Why? Because God, see, tithing is not just an act that you do. It is a spiritual exercise. It is, you're saying, I am dying to the flesh because my natural tendency is to hold back, isn't it? But then, have you ever noticed, research has actually shown, and this may shock you, that the more people earn, the harder it is for them to pay their tithe. Okay, talk to me. You know, if you're earning 10,000 shillings, and you have to pay 1,000 bob for tithe, it's very easy. All right? Why? Because 10,000 is not a lot. So even if you pay your 1,000, you'll still be broke anyway. So <laughs> one way or the other. But the day now you're earning 100,000, and then now you have to pay how much? That, and that 10,000 is just a tithe. That's basic minimum. <laughs> and by the way, 100,000 gross. Not net. Write it. Because I keep hearing people asking that question all the time. You pay tithe from the gross. See, now nobody will even say amen here. <laughs> all right? Now, when you're earning 100,000 shillings, now you have to pay 10,000. Let me tell you, it's a bit more difficult than paying 1,000 shillings. Isn't it? Now, then God has blessed you. Now you're earning a million. Anybody earning a million? Don't lift up your hand. <laughs> then now, you have to pay how much? You see, now you're even saying it very quickly, boldly. A hundred thousand. Some of you are even looking shocked. And you're thinking, oh, now what will the church do with all that money? It's difficult, isn't it? The more you earn, so the, the more you earn, the more difficult it is for you to pay tithe. Why? Because the flesh has a way of, it's always about me, myself, and I. And that is why the principle of tithing is important for us so that we always set our priorities right. See, if you, are, if you are a lover of God and your priorities are right, Sunday morning comes, when you wake up in the morning, coming to church should not be an issue of debate. Oh, come on. That's, you should not be wondering whether I should go and play golf or come to church. Because I am a lover of God, I will be like the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We will do other things after church, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There has to be certain priorities in you. There has to be a priority around the word of God. Do you love the word? Which is more important, your newspaper or the word? I guarantee you, most people, by the way, spend three hours reading the newspaper. Isn't it? Now, and I keep saying, I mean, honestly, think about it. Think about it with me. You spend those three hours, after three hours, you're depressed. Because if it is not the, about the fuel, it's about that politician. If it's not about politician, it's about this whoever, who killed who. Three hours. No, let me tell you, in case you didn't know, good news doesn't sell. <laughs> Bad news sells. When you're buying a newspaper, do you know what you're buying? <laughs> Basic, that's what you're buying, bad news. But when you have a Bible, what do you have? But why is it we have an appetite for bad news? My goodness. And then you wonder why you're depressed most of the times? Maybe you should spend more time reading the good news. You know how I read my newspapers now? Most of the times at least. I just flip through. Because I'm thinking, this will not help me put food on the table. This information, who cares what happened there? I mean, it doesn't help me. It doesn't add anything most of the times. But when I spend an hour reading the word. <laughs> man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Try it. It works. I love the word. You come to my car. I promise you, normally there's a, there's a, when I'm driving in traffic, and you know Nairobi traffic is, you know how Nairobi traffic can be. So normally you know what I have going on in my car? Either some gospel music or 
I'm listening to a sermon somewhere. Because I love the word. I love, your words were found and we did eat them. That's what the prophet said. I love, and, and sometimes I enjoy traffic jam. Because sometimes I'm listening to this word and I'm thinking, let's go slowly. This, this word is too good. It's too nice. But if you're listening to classic FM, okay, let's talk in this place. Let's talk. Let's talk. Because, because, because then you come, you come and then we have to, to, you're telling us we need to bind that spirit of depression in you. Let me help you. You're listening to classic FM for one hour. The music is pathetic. They're talking about grinding people. Okay, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Don't worry about that. <laughs> then there used to be this show. I don't even know where it comes. Busted. I know you guys. This is Sita Moodley. They don't listen to those. Okay, let me tell you. There used to be this show on Classic F. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's what you're eating and digesting. And you expect victory in your life. Because we are transformed. By the renewing. The battle always begins in the mind. Sometimes you can bind all you want. You can lose all you want. But unless the battle has been won up here, you'll struggle. I'm telling you. <laughs> Prioritize the word. Prioritize the things of God. Let me tell you, it works. You will be happier. Tomorrow is Monday morning. You will not be grouchy when you go to the office. When you have been feeding on the word, on Monday morning you will be excited until everybody gets irritated in the office with you. Because they're wondering, how can you be so happy? Because they have been drinking the whole weekend and fooling around the whole weekend. But for you, as for me and my house, we were in the house of the Lord, we were praising the Lord, and the Lord fed us. My goodness. May the Lord help us. Priorities. Tell your neighbor, prioritize. You know, anybody ever been in love here? Let me see by a show of hand. Anybody ever been in love? You know, especially if you're sitting next to your spouse, you better lift that hand. <laughs> <laughs> or you've been in trouble. Yeah, if we just look at you and say, eh? <laughs> Baba Nani. After all these years, Kume, you were never in love with me. You know how those, anyway, never mind. Anybody ever been in love? When you are in love <laughs> with that one, what happens? It turns your world upside down. Your priorities change. You will be calling that person for three hours, you're talking on the phone. Talking about, I love you. I love you more. No, me, I love you. <laughs> then that, <laughs> then you know that, then, then suddenly the stories have, have quished and you're just there on the phone. So, what are you thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> Your priorities change, even if you're broke. <laughs> you will find that 200 shillings for that cup of coffee just to hang out for 30 minutes with this one that you love, isn't it? Because you're in love with them. When you see them passing by, hey, the heart, the, the heart, the heart rate increases, isn't it? <laughs> Some people, I think, are in love in this place. They're they laughing, man. <laughs> but love has a way of changing our priorities. Isn't it? You want to spend time with the one that you love. Number two, and I need to move quickly. Our expression of, of our love for God, it will affect the way we walk. And my walk, notice in that verse in, in, in 2 Timothy, he says that people will be lovers of themselves. They will be abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. But if you're a lover of God, it will affect your walk, the way you live your life. You will be somebody who walks in humility and thankful, just being thankful to the Lord for who you are. It will affect the way you live. People can be able to look at you and say, oh, this person is different. Listen, I don't know about you, but probably maybe I'm still old school. I still believe in an old-time religion. 
that changes people. I used to be blind, but now I see. I used to do this, but now since I met the Savior, I stopped doing that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There has to be something different about you. You cannot, you, you, you cannot, be, you cannot be born again and say, I have had a real experience with, with Jesus Christ and I'm a lover of God, and yet you're still doing all kinds of madness, going to all the wrong places. It changes the person. Your walk is changed. It changes the way you treat people. Can we talk about that just for a little while? How you talk to your house help and how you treat them. Now it's going to get very quiet in here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? My house help at home should be the first to give at my testimony and say, ah, so and so, my boss, that person is truly born again. But sometimes you talk to house helps, they will tell you who the real people are. I'm serious. Because somewhere in our minds, we think they are, they are, they are children of a lesser God. We treat them like they're useless. Many of them are not in that job because that was their dream job. Circumstances in their lives conspired and now they're in your home, but God brings them to your home. Not so that you can punish them further, but so that you can love them. Love them back to wholeness. Love them and probably encourage them to go to the next level. It is our responsibility. You should see that person that this is somebody, an opportunity, although they're working in my house, is an opportunity for me to minister to them. Oh, can I talk to you a little bit further? Can I take it a bit further? I know it's getting uncomfortable. It's getting hot in here, isn't it? <laughs> when you came with your car to church, that person, that volunteer who was trying to help you in the parking lot, under the hot sun, if there are people who have tales to tell at our parking attendants, and by the way, these are volunteers. They're not on full, they're not, they're not members of staff. But these are people who they feel that that is their labor of love. That they want you as you're coming to church. you in your nice, beautiful car. They're telling you, please park here so that when you go into the service and you're worshiping, you will be comfortable that your car is taken care of. But sometimes they give you instructions. Oh my goodness. And some of us back at them. Some of us talk back at them. Sometimes we don't even listen to what they are saying. Sometimes, unfortunately, we insult them. Very quiet, it's getting hot in here. You want to go? <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying? Our walk, the way I walk, the way I live, must be affected. How I drive my car in this crazy Nairobi jam. Are you the one who is always overlapping? Can we talk in this place? Do you obey traffic rules? I know it's a difficult thing travel, driving in Nairobi, but even in the road, I must be a witness. Amen. There was a time in Gong, I remember I was, we were going somewhere. So I'm driving, and it was just in some of those back streets of Ngong. And so there was this pickup, and this guy was kind of driving a little crazy. You know the way they are. You know, and this guy is cutting me off all the time, and I'm wondering, who is this dude? I mean, what is wrong with him? Can he just drive properly? And I'm getting a bit agitated, so we are going, and the guy is driving. Was, I tried to overtake him. He doesn't want me to overtake, and I'm wondering, like, what's going on? Anybody ever gone through that? Okay, pray for me, because it's clearly I have an issue. So here I am, and I'm wondering, this guy. So at one point, uh, our, you know, I, I, we had to stop, and of course, so our cars now are just parallel to each other. So then I see this guy, he rolled down his window, and then he's with a big smile on his face, and he said, as if you're a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> now imagine, imagine, if I had to be there, where, where? you know the way we do Kenyans. Where, where? <laughs> he said, born as if you're a pastor. Now, what do you think I said? Do you think I'll say, wait, wait, Nini, you know, I'm going pass Do you think I told you? <laughs> okay, hey, brothers, if we were, hey, man, hallelujah. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm, because sometimes that's how we lose our weakness. Just by those small, but look, can I tell you, it's not in the big things. It's not in the big things. You don't have to go and, and, and steal billions. Sometimes it's in the small, little things. That's where the battle is won or lost. 
how we treat people in the supermarket, those cashiers. Is there anybody here? Sometimes we lose our cool, isn't it? How do we talk to them? Imagine if that person knew you are a believer. Would you still talk to them that way? And sometimes, I'll tell you, sometimes our patience is test tested, isn't it? I was just giving this example. So you go to the supermarket and you're in this queue. And um, so the person who is in front of me is this, unfortunately, a lot of times, and no disrespect to all the women here, is a lady. <laughs> so they, are, and they have this, their cart is full, you know, to the brim. Right? So they come and tit, tit, tit. So the cashier is everything, 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 you know. So they, and it takes quite a bit of time. Then, see, of course, you know, nowadays they have those machines, so it shows you how much. So this mama, <laughs> after all this time, so she's told how much it is. Of course, she can see, but she's told how much it is. Then, that's the time she gets her big bag. I don't know what you usually need this girl in these things. Eh? <laughs> that's the time now she starts looking for her pass. <laughs> which has the money. So you're there at the queue and you're counting one to ten because you're thinking this is... Then, after a few minutes of shuffling, she finds her pass. Then she removes the pass and she says, I didn't remember Ngapi. <laughs> Anybody ever gone through that? <laughs> so it's not just me. To ombeane. <laughs> and, and she's a nice person. I mean, it's not there's something wrong with her. It's just that, you know, and then, then of course, she starts counting, you know. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Moving on. In other words, friends, all I'm just saying, it's in the small things. Are you hearing me? Our passions. Notice in 2 Timothy, he says that people will be Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What are your passions? What is that thing that drives you? And sometimes you can always tell that your, your heart is being misled by the things that you're becoming passionate about. You know, for example, and can, they can be very legitimate things. It doesn't have to be things that are out there. It can be very legitimate things. Maybe, maybe, maybe probably you're, you're passionate about your soccer. I love soccer too, by the way. You know, but sometimes if that thing seems to be taking you over, then probably it's a time for me to take a step back and say, hey, maybe it's something that is not. But I have to guard my heart. I have to ensure that my passions are, other passions for other things are not taking over my love for the things of God. And then finally, of course, uh, and this is not exhaustive, but our expression of our love to God should be reflected in our giving, friends. Uh, we offer first ourselves, our bodies as living sacrifices. We give of ourselves, we give of our time. That's why we've been encouraging you in this month of missions and outreach. You need to give of your time, give of your resources. It means that sometimes you'll get uncomfortable. It will not be out of your convenience. Sometimes you, it will be out of your, uh, just out of that labor of love. You say, whether it is convenient or not, I will show up. Whether it is shining or not, I will come. Whether it is raining or not, I will be there. That's what it's all about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because it's not, can you imagine if Christ had not come for us? Can you, he would have probably said, no, 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 it's not convenient for me. Uh, I'd rather just sit right here where I am, I have been. Let these mortals sort out their own problems. We will not be here, friends. But our love for, what, for, for God is what compels us. And it should be reflected in our giving of our resources, our time, because God has blessed us. By the way, a lot of times the excuse that we give as Christians and as God's people that I cannot give is because, oh, now the price of fuel has gone up. Isn't it? Talk to me, people. Because there's always an excuse why I cannot give, why I cannot participate. But do you know, research has shown this, that... And, and by the way, in trying to define who a wealthy person is, sitting here, I guarantee you, 99.9% .9 of us are wealthy. Can I demonstrate that? How many of you here, you have a television set at home? TV, even if it's black and white. Let me see. By the way, do they still have those? 
Just lift up. I'm not going to ask for your TV. Just lift up your hand. <laughs> just lift up. You have a TV at home? Just lift it up. Which then suggests to me that you have electricity in your house. Anybody with electricity in the house? Electricity. Let me see. All right. Now, this is irrespective of where you live. Are you with me? All right? If you have a TV in your house and you have electricity in your house, you are wealthy. Because a TV and electricity, those are luxury items. <laughs> Can we talk in this place? How, do you need electricity to live? <laughs> you don't. In other words, if you can afford something of luxury, it means you're not poor. Tell your neighbor you're not poor. Oh. And here is the deal, friend. Nobody is too poor not to have anything to give. I may not give money, but I can give my time. I may not have the liquidity for cash, but there is something I can give. Find that thing and give it out. Give it away. Then finally, secondly, is love for one another. So we begin with the love for God, and then that should automatically translate into love for one another. John chapter 13 verse 35. This is what Jesus said, but by this everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you do what? If you... Now, this verse, I think for me, is very, very pivotal, especially in our understanding of the Christian faith. Notice what Jesus Christ said. He said, the world will not know us because of our miracles, signs and wonders. Now, that's not to suggest that I don't believe in miracles. I have seen so many miracles in my, in, in my short life. I mean, I've seen God work miracles in my own life, in the lives of so many people. I've seen God healing uh, people from, uh, you know, from diseases and, and providing miraculous ways. And I believe in a God of miracles. But you know what, what, what Jesus said? The world will not know that we are his, we are, we are God's people, because of signs and wonders. It will know that we are God's people by what? Our love for who? For one another. In other words, as we are gathered here in Sitam Woodley, one of the things I must, I must say about Sitam Woodley, if there's love in a church I have seen, is actually Sitam Woodley. I mean, people love one another in this church. One of the things that I, why I say that is like when somebody is bereaved or somebody maybe is in hospital or maybe one need or the other, the SMSs, I mean, move fast in this church. And people begin responding very quickly. And, you know, I mean, sometimes even people you don't even know. You've just been told they've been bereaved. Suddenly you're just there in your home. And that has been an amazing experience for us through the SG groups. And that's why by the way you need to belong to an SG group. That is a safari group. Because that is where love is also expressed, all right? So if there's one thing that I have come to really appreciate about Sita Moodley is that this is a church of love. People truly, truly love one another. However, our love for one another is something that we must keep growing in. Even having said that. Are you with me? All right? Why? Because when somebody maybe, and that's why I was, I was challenging you, invite somebody to church. You know why? Not so much they can come and listen to Pastor Jesse. But so that when they come through those doors, they will sense the love of God's people. Come on, talk to me. Can I tell you, in the world, there's a scarcity of love. Who are the custodians of that agape love? Except the people of God. There are people who live their lives on a daily basis and they don't believe anybody loves them. When they come here, they should, you know, when, when you go to an atmosphere that has love, nobody has to tell you. Come on, people. You can actually, have you ever, by the way, have you ever walked into an atmosphere of, of people, maybe a group of people, and immediately you walked in there, you knew, I, I'm not needed here. <laughs> Anybody ever gone through that? Nobody told you anything. In fact, they even said all the right things. They said karibu, but after a few moments, you realize, hey, yeah. Iko kitu. And then there are also some, have you ever also gone to a place where nobody even told you anything, you just entered there, and you just sensed love. Anybody? Because love is something that is either there, you can't fake it. And our churches must be places where people sense the love of Christ. Because that is how people are drawn to Jesus Christ. So he said, they will know you are my disciples because of your love one for another. In other words, just look at your neighbor, that neighbor next to you. I know they may have sat on you when they were worshipping. Just look at them. The other one, okay. If that one didn't. You know that person next to you? Do you know that that person who is next to you, you have an obligation to them? To love them? 
Whether you know them or not, you have an obligation to love them. Do you know Sita Moodley will not be with Sita Moodley without that person? Talk to me. In other words, everybody here, the least and the greatest, everybody is important. Sita Moodley will not be Sita Moodley without that person. Imagine how, or how, how, how bad you will feel if you came to church on a Sunday and you're the only one seated here. <laughs> how would you feel? Would you say, today I had church all by myself? <laughs> but normally, how do we normally say, oh, we had church? And you didn't even know how the people. But we had, because we need one another. The power of love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. This is Ephesians chapter 4. This is the Apostle Paul saying, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called, one love, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. In fact, then the Apostle Paul um, went ahead there to tell the people, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. My point here being, the Apostle Paul was so keen about trying to help the church to maintain unity, the unity of love, the unity of the Spirit. Because the Apostle Paul, in his mind, he understood one thing, that the enemy, if there's one thing that the enemy wants to do where the church of God and the people of God are concerned, is to bring divisions among people. And the moment the church of God or the people of God begin being disunited and of course factions begin developing and sects begin developing, you know what happens immediately? We begin losing our witness. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul still cap captured in that 1 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, and also in chapter 3, he captures the same thought. He tells that, I, I appeal to you brothers and sisters in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree, notice he says, with one another in what you say and that there may be no divisions among you. Why was Paul saying that? He was saying that because he knows unity is, is not uniformity. We don't have to be alike. We don't have to be similar for us to be united. Did you know that? All right? We are all different. We, are, we all come in different shapes and sizes, by the way. We all come to all kinds of um, backgrounds that are presented here. Some of us are, 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 are rich, we come from wealth, others come from poverty. Uh, are, we come from different communities, different socializations, different age groups, and one of you. But that does not mean that we cannot be united. Are you with me? Because our strength is in our unity. Psalm 133. It says, Blessed. Are we when brethren live together in unity? In fact, he continues by saying, For there the Lord does what? Commands a blessing when we are united. So this, this church in Corinth, of course, some are saying, oh, me, I belong to Cephas, me, I belong to Apollos, and now I'm saying I, was, I belong to Paul. So in, in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, uh, Apostle Paul says, what after all is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has made it grow. He was saying, let's not be divided. At the end of the day, we should be united around Jesus Christ. It's not about that person or that other person. Oh, this one preaches better than the other one. Or that one does this better than the other one. We can, be all, we can all complement one another. So as we, as we move, and of course as we are almost coming to a close here. So then how do we express our love one to another? And I want to move this very quickly and then we'll be done for the day. Are you still in church? Is your mind still here? Amen. So number one, the first thing then, how then do we enhance our love one for another? The first thing is cooperation and not competition. We are not called to a competition, friends. As I said, we are different, isn't it? Come on, talk to me. I said we are different. We all have different gifts and talents. And we all, our destinies are different. Our purposes are different. So we should not be competing one against the other. Instead, ours is to cooperate. We must find places of cooperation. So if you can do something better than me, why should I struggle doing that thing? Are you with me? All right? If so-and-so can do this better than me, let them do it. Because at the end of the day, when they do it, we are all successful, isn't it? 
If this one can do the other thing better than me, well, let them do it. And let me do what I am good at. Let me tell you this. There are things I don't, even in the pastoral ministry. All right? You know the thing about when you're a pastor, when you're a pastor, you, you're actually a jack of all trades. And sometimes a master of all. Because a pastor, you, do, you wear many hats. You do many hats, by the way. Um, you know, on the spiritual angle, you're not just, you know, pastoral ministry alone. Can I help you understand? You know when you're a pastor, you're a pastor, a shepherd, a shepherd you're also a father. Sometimes you're a mother. <laughs> um, you're a coach, you're a mentor. All right? You do all these things, and you have to know how to juggle which heart at any one given time. All right? Sometimes you're a counselor. Sometimes you're a psychiatrist. <laughs> I'm serious, by the way, and I'm not saying this lightly. That's just the work of a pastor, all right? And you juggle all those hats, and then administratively, you find you're a manager, you're a CEO, you're an architect, you're a contractor, you do everything. Because when, when people come to church, and probably something has gone wrong in this tent, guess who they ask? Me, I'm not a contractor. Why, why aren't you asking, uh, what's his name? Elder Marina here who is a contractor. I don't know nothing about building. But at the end of the day, pastor, what is going on with our building? And me, I'm thinking, me, I don't know. <laughs> but you end up wearing many hats at any one given time. Now, usually, you'll find any pastor, even the ones who are here, they are good at some things, and every one of us have our primary strength. But there are things, honestly, I don't like, I don't enjoy, but I have to do them. So normally when I find somebody who can do them better than me, I am happy. I say, you run with that one. Let me do what God... Like if you are to ask me to teach or preach, I can do this in my, in, in, in my sleep. All right? Because I love the... This is how God has gifted me. If you want me to... I, I mean, you can wake me up at midnight and I'll have a sermon. <laughs> it just flows out of me. It just, it just flows out of me. I mean, it's, that's what I'm good at, isn't it? But then there are some things, please don't ask me to do. I will allow somebody else to... Gladly allow somebody else to do those. I will not tell you which ones. Because that's what you're waiting for. I will not tell you. I will not tell you. See what I'm be? <laughs> it is for you to find out. But the problem is that sometimes we judge one another on the things we are not good at. Isn't that what we do? Sometimes we do that to our children. Isn't it? Instead of celebrating the things they are good at, sometimes we begin chastising them for the things they're not good at. How many of you grew up with that misfortune where you brought home your report card and maybe mathematics, you got an A, English, you got an A, you had a number of A's, but then you also had maybe two C's or a D somewhere. And maybe your guardian or your dad, he missed out on all the A's. Somehow, he just, he, he was blinded. He's a spirit of blindness. He didn't see the old, but he saw the D. Anybody ever went through that? And you're chastised for that. And sometimes when you do that, you're punishing somebody maybe for an area that they're not, they're not really gifted in. But for us as God's people, let's not criticize one another for things that we are not good at. All right? If, the, if you begin criticizing me or, or somebody else for the things that they're not, you can criticize them from morning to evening. It will not change a whit. Because it's not my primary strength. Number two, our expression for love for one another, protect the unity of the body of Christ. Now, please hear me and hear me. Please look at me on this one. This is important. This is going to be worth your lunch. All right? We need to protect the unity of the body. Hear me. Are you listening? We need to do what? Protect the unity of the body of Christ. And I want to say this because this is important. I know times have changed, and I know we live in democratic times. The church, the body of Christ, listen, are you listening? The body of Christ is not a democracy. The local church is not a democracy. It is a theocracy. We take our orders from above. Not state house. Higher than state house. The Bible is our guiding instrument. Are you with? Uh, please listen because this is important. This is important because in the times that we are living in, sometimes people do not realize that the church is not a democracy. So sometimes people sometimes, even in the body of Christ, want to demand 
things. Oh, no, no, we must do it now. Please also understand this. When I talk about church in order democracy, there are things, of course, we may take a vote. We may all decide, ah, I think let's do this or let's do the other. Those are you know, matters of operation and what have you. So, for example, we may decide, oh, the church has grown too much. Uh, let's change our service from 11 to 11.30. Are you with me? And you say, how many of you, is that okay? And then we will take her. That's not, that's, not, that's not a big thing. But there are matters, matters of principle, matters of biblical doctrine. There is no democracy on that. We have to go by what the Bible says, and we have to protect the unity of the spirit by, 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 by finding in ourselves that place of humility which says, I may not really understand this, I may not agree with it, uh, uh, but because it is a matter of principle, and this is where the Lord is leading, I agree. Are you with me? Please listen to me. And, this is, and especially for those of us who are younger. And I know especially when we are younger, most of the times, you know, we are usually full of all these ideas and what have you. Please, I beg you. All right? It is important for you to, once in a while, take direction. Listen to voices of reason. Not just in the church, but wherever you go. It's not always, you must not always have your way. Life is bigger than you. The plot is bigger than your experience. Are you with me? And allow other people also to speak into your life. It is important. We must maintain. And you've heard me preach this from my heart almost every other time I stand on this pulpit. That it is important for us to pull together as a church. The young, the old. Because we are one in Christ. We cannot say, oh, I follow this one or I follow the other. Because Christ is not divided. My goodness. I wish you would hear my heart on this because this is where our strength is, friends. Every time in the Old Testament, especially when the church decided to become democratic or God's people decided to become democratic, they ended up in problems. You remember the nation of Israel, they decided, they took a democratic vote and said, we want to be like other nations. You remember in the time of, of, uh, of Samuel? And what did God do? He said, well, fine, if that's what you want. He said, it's not my perfect will, that's, your, that's, your, that's what you want, but we will allow you to do that. So who was the first king? The first king was a man called King Saul. King Saul messed it up. You remember that? He ended badly. Messed up the whole nation. Why? If you think about it, when you look at the character of King Saul, Saul was a man after the people's heart. So God said, oh, you really want somebody? Because this is the state and condition of your heart. I will give a man after your own heart. So that after Saul had messed it up, then God said, now it is my turn. Let me give you a man after my own heart. And who did he give them? David. A man after God's own heart. Listen, friends, democracy does not always lead us in the direction of God. It is okay for politics, by the way. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It is okay for politics, but in the church, we are not a democracy. We are, say, theocracy. Say theocracy. Theocracy, theocracy means that God is in control. We take our orders from him. You remember again, also the children of Israel, while they were out in the wilderness, and they decided to take a vote because Moses had gone out to Mount Sinai, and he had taken about 40 days when he was, uh, God was giving him the Ten Commandments. So what did the people say? They say, even this fellow Moses, we don't know whether he's coming back. So what did they do? They said, ah, Aaron, you are here. Please, look for another alternative. And they took a vote. And Aaron, unfortunately, did not provide leadership. He, he, he told them, please bring all your gold earrings and one of you. And he took them and he, he, out of it, he brought together and made together and formed a golden calf. And then the people started worshipping around the golden calf. They began prostituting themselves around the golden calf. Moses coming down the mountain finds the church all naked and partying. And out of that, 3,000 died out of democracy. Because um, at the end of the day, sometimes God's ways are not popular. But they're the right ways. How many of you know when you have a child, sometimes your child is crying for pizza every day. How many of you decide, ah, I'm to a pizza killer ziku. How many of you will do that? Only a foolish parent will do that, isn't it? Sometimes you have to say, no, you're going to eat spinach. <laughs> oh, you're going to eat broccoli. Why? Because you're the parent. You know that spinach and broccoli are important. Does the child enjoy it? They don't enjoy it. 
but you know it will work for them. A harvest of righteousness. <laughs> Isn't it? Friends, I ask you, I beg you by the mass, let's maintain the unity of the spirit. Let's maintain the unity of the spirit. Let's not, let's not dig in our heels on certain things and say, no, 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 no. They, they, they must do this, they must do the other. Let's maintain the unity of the spirit. We must also bear with one another's burdens. And as I said earlier, here in Sitam Woodley, thank God we are already doing that, but we have to keep growing in it. Bearing with one another, praying for one another. Sharing and protecting one another. Tell your neighbor, please protect me. The other one? There's no protection the way you are, is there? <laughs> Listen, do you realize that the enemy is, a, is after every one of you here? And sometimes he will stir up all manner of crazy stuff about you. How I pray that God's body and God's people, we can protect one another. Protecting one another doesn't mean that we are burying our heads in the sand and pretending everything is okay. But it means that even when my brother has messed up, listen, listen to me, even when my sister has messed up, that I can still be able to love them and still be able to pray with them and still be able to stand with them and still be able to believe in them and decide I am not going to gossip about them. Amen. Are you with me? That's what it means. How many of you, if I was to ask in this place right now, how many of you know or you wish you had somebody who can protect you in your lowest moments? Because all of us will have a weak moment. Anybody here? You're saying, man, even when I mess up, I want to know that there will be somebody who will still believe in me. Anybody who is like that in this place? All of us, isn't it? And why don't you be that person who protects the other person? Then number four, fellowship. Keeping up and let's consider how we may inspire one another unto good works. Fellowship, the Greek word is koinonia, strengthening the fellowship. And then finally, number five, because I have to finish, and allow me just to say this one, is use your love signature. Now, there's a book that was written some years ago which became very popular called The, the, the Five Languages of Love. Man, you remember that book? Especially for couples, which is good. Amazing book, by the way. Helped a lot of people. But I also discovered, apart from the five love languages, which usually is more inward looking, because you're saying that, uh, for me, please, if you're going to love me, love me this way. This is what I respond to. But there's also what we call your love signature. Your love signature is how you express your love to other people. Are you with me? Come on, talk to me, people. Now, there's a story that is given to us. We may not even be able to look at it in Acts chapter 9. There was a lady, a girl there called Dorcas, or another name for her was Tabitha. And Dorcas, the Bible actually records that she died. But she was remembered because of her good works. In fact, among the widows, and uh, when she died, they called the apostle Peter, who, came, who was in town. And they called him and said, oh, this lady. And everybody was mourning because Dorcas was beloved. She was a woman who was known for her good works. So when, when Peter came in, before he could perform the miracle, the women, the widows, came and started showing the garments that Dorcas had made for them. In other words, it was her love signature. She reached out to people. She did things for people, tangible things for people. What is your love signature? Some of you are very hospitable, isn't it? You're always thinking of cooking something for somebody. Come on, can we talk in this place? All right? There are some of you, by the way, you like baking. You just like, I mean, you enjoy. I mean, there's some, I mean, it's amazing how God created us. There are some of you, by the way, you'll go, you will bake and bake and bake and bake. But your satisfaction is when you see somebody tasting that cake and the smile on their face. Anybody like that in this place? And you will do anything. That's your love signature. Do it. Find somebody, by the way. Some of us love cakes, by the way, just so you know. There's a lady who used to, a friend of ours, and she normally makes fruit cake. Let me tell you, that is the best fruit cake in the whole world. When you eat that fruit cake, it's like eating heaven. Because you can sense it is made with love. I, never, I remember Sister White, every December, just before Christmas, she will bake a number of, of fruit cakes. That's why I started loving fruit cake. And she will give people as many as she could fruit cakes. And at least you will go in home and have a fruit cake for Christmas. And that was her love signature, by the way. And then and, and, and you have to find every one of you. Some of you are just generous. I mean, you can't hold money. You are just generous. For you, you just give. Because that's your love signature. You always, in fact, you look for opportunities to give. That is your love. Don't give up. Keep doing it. Why? Because I have discovered the more I use my love signature, the more the Lord blesses me. 
Can we talk? Can I tell you? You will never go broke because you give. You will never sleep hungry because you give. You will never become poor because you give. Because God is no man's debtor. When you give, whatever it is, when you release it from you, for some of you, it is just service. You just love serving people. Uh, uh, do I have people who are like that? I mean, for you, you can't just sit down and be served. For you, you have to wake up and you have to make sure everybody is okay, everybody is comfortable. That is your love signature. Use it. For some of you, you just want to pray for people. And for you, you just see some, you don't even ask them if there's an issue. You just want to get into your closet and pray for them. That is your love signature. Whatever it is, for some of you, you hear somebody is sick or somebody has been bereaved. You don't even know them. You don't even care to know who they are. You, you just ask where do they live or where in hospital. You just go. Do I have people like that? I know some of you who are like that. And you just go and you just want to minister to them. Keep doing that. Find your love. Tell your neighbor, find your love signature. Find your love signature. By the way, we will be happier if we all operated with our love signature. Do you realize that? Whatever it is, some of you just love children. You just want to love children. You just want to minister to them. You just want to be around them. You just want to say something to them. You just want to encourage them. Find it. Go ahead. Do it. Whatever it is. And you'll find that in God's house, we are not poor. Because if everybody did whatever God has anointed them to do, oh, there will be so much wealth in the house of the Lord. For some of you, all you need, all you need is just to find somebody who is not born again. And for you, you cannot stand the thought that this person is not born again. You will tell them about the love, whether they want to hear, whether they don't want to hear, you will be telling them, oh, Jesus loves you. Until they get born again, that's your love signature. Find it. Do it. Minister to some. Every one of us here is a minister. Amen. Have you received the word of the Lord? Now, uh, as we finish, I want to just invite today, I'm doing an altar call, a very interesting altar call. I'm going to invite my pastors who are here. If you will just come up here, and I want you to just face the crowd, face the congregation. All my pastors, if you will just come. And I just want to say something about these men and women of God. Aren't you blessed by your pastors, by the way? Or you don't look like you love them. Do you, do you love your pastors? Listen. These men and women are the men and women that God has given to Sitam Woodley for this season. All right? Uh, they could have been elsewhere, but God has found it fit to bring them here. And I want to say this, and I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. These men and women, some of them are not even here, people like Pastor Mauricio. All of us, and me included, we do what we do because of a call. The love of God compels us. We don't do this because of our paycheck. Are you with me? Because there are times people have even said harsh words against pastors. Oh, you know you pastors, you are paid to do what you do. We are not paid to do what we do. You can never pay a pastor enough. I, I, I tell you that. You can never pay a pastor enough. This, we, we, do you know what keeps us going? If you are to ask every one of these ones, do you know what keeps us going? Do you know why we do what we do? The love of Christ. Because we want to see Christ formed in every one of you. The joy of a pastor is to see a life changed, a life transformed. Somebody who was hopeless receiving some form of hope. That's why we do what we do. But these men and women, friends, they're not superhumans. They're as human as they come. These men and women get discouraged. These men and women, by the way, me included, eh? we get weary. Sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we hurt. Sometimes our families go through issues. Sometimes our families go through troubles and trials. But we never ever will tell anybody. Why? Not because we are trying to be superhuman, but because we are pastors. We are supposed to be dispensing hope. Imagine if I came here on a Sunday and stood on the pulpit and said, hey, what happened? Hey, where? <laughs> How many of you will listen to me after that? Even sometimes we preach, listen, sometimes we preach out of a broken heart. We minister sometimes. But God knows the tears that we've cried. I ask you, and I'm, the reason why I'm saying all this is to ask you, Sitam Woodley, I know you're a loving church. I really know that. I have seen that. I've experienced it for myself. Pray for us. 
I say pray for us. Please. Once in a while, you see these men and women, as much as they're encouraging you, they also need encouragement once in a while. We have never stood on this pulpit, and I know that because it's a sit -down, and asked you for money. Have we? We have never. We have never tried to fleece you from anything. And we will never do that. Because for us, we believe that it is between you and, and the Lord. All right? So we don't do this thing so that you can sow a seed into our ministries. All right? It is between you and the Lord. However, I'll tell you this. Pray for us. Once in a while, encourage these men and women, by the way. Send a text. Call once in a while. Walk into somebody, one of them, their offices, and say, Pastor, I just want to pray with you. Are you with me? Let me tell you, because of our calling and because of where we are and who we are, sometimes, sometimes we are easy targets. Easy targets of all manner of criticism, of all manner of hatred and resentment. I can tell you that. I'm a pastor and I know. I know some of the battles I've had to endure myself and I, every one of them can tell you of their own battles. Because you see, when you're in the limelight, People don't just see, they don't just see your giftings, they also see your weaknesses. Did you know that? So it's easy. If you, I mean, weaknesses, we are, we are not perfect. We are not perfect. It's easy to say all manner of things against pastors and men of God. But I can tell you one thing. We, whatever we do, we are as sincere as sincere can be. We are not here trying to build a name for ourselves. Pastor Jesus is not trying to build a name for himself or any of these pastors. I can tell you that. That's not, that's not our purpose in life. If it was money we wanted, I'm telling you, even so some of us where we come from, they know we will be millionaires. Not through the ministry. Through Biachara. <laughs> are you with me? But this is what God has called us to do. Can we agree together, Sita Moodley? That as a church and as God's people, we will stand together, we will pray for our pastors and our leaders also, and we will protect them. Can nobody say anything in here? So please rise up on your feet. And I want these men of God to, I don't know whether you guys can be able to come up so that people can see you all the way to the back. There's a platform behind you. I don't know whether you can. Uh, yeah, oh, that's a gentleman. Anyway, let's. <laughs> yeah. So that everybody can see us all the way to the back. I want us to just, I want us to just stretch our hands. Um, and I just want to bless, oh, we just want to bless you. We just want to bless you. Uh, so the uh, pastors, let's just stretch forth our hands towards the people of God. And, um, Father, we thank you. Thank you for your people. Lord, as your ministers, as pastors, as shepherds, we have nothing of our own to give them. All we have is the love of Christ. And the love of Christ constrains us and compels us to be of service to these men and women. Father, we bless them. We bless every man and every woman, every boy, every girl, every child, every young person. We bless them with every good thing from above. We bless them with gifts of, of, of love and we bless them, dear Father, with prophecies of healing and restoration over them. We speak your blessing over them, Father. And we want to pray and declare that this church, Sita Moodley, will be a church that will be driven by love and unity and a sense of togetherness. Father, where people have hurt one another, where people have pulled apart, forgive us, we ask, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Would you just come and baptize us afresh with the baptism of love? So we speak your blessing over your people now. And now may... The Lord cause his face to shine upon every last one of you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you. Sit on Woodley. May the Lord bless you through and through. And may Christ be formed in every last one of you, both now and forevermore. And now may the grace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now. Amen. Before we finish with the 23rd Psalm, just to remind all class 8 parents, please meet Pastor George Ndongo just outside the nursery hall. Outside the nursery hall, just for a couple of minutes. He has some things he needs to share with you. So find somebody next to you. And I want us to finish with the 23rd Psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Wednesday we are here. Wednesday 6 p.m. Powerhouse. God bless you.